We're continuing this series of messages on the uh, revelatory nature or ministry of the miracles of Jesus. Christ's miracles, from a scriptural point of view, were a definition of doing good. Mm-hmm. Acts 10.38 says that Jesus went about doing good. Now, he didn't mean that he built special furniture for people because he was a carpenter. He went about doing good. And it referred mainly to his miracles, which he did, and healing all who oppressed the devil. So what Jesus did, he embodied good, mm-hmm. which in this case had to do with the correcting uh, the effects of sin. Tonight we're going to view the feeding of the 5,000, a rather uh, well-known Miracle is one of the very few miracles. It's in all four Gospels. I'm going to take the text from Matthew, the 15th chapter, 14th chapter, verses 15 through 21, and then it'll refer to the other accounts as we proceed. And when it was evening, his disciples came to him, saying, This is a desert place, and the time is now past. Send the multitude away that they may go into the villages and buy themselves victuals. But Jesus said unto them, They need not depart. Give ye them to eat. Mm -hmm. And they say unto him, We have here but five loaves and two fishes. He said, Bring them hither to me. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass, on the grass and took the five loaves and two fishes and looking up to heaven he blessed and break and gave the loaves to his disciples and the disciples to the multitude and they did all eat and were filled Mm -hmm. and they took up of the fragments that remained twelve baskets full Mm -hmm. and they that had eaten were about five thousand men beside women and children now let's look at the background of this, because this was, uh, when this particular miracle was wrought, some folk would have called it a day by this time. Mm-hmm. They would have said, well, let's, let's put off, let's do the rest of the things, anything further to do, we'll do tomorrow. It's been a full day. This followed the report that John the Baptist had been beheaded. They took his body and buried it. The disciples came to the prison, took the body of John, and buried it. They didn't cremate it. They buried it. Mm -hmm. And went and told Jesus. And when Jesus heard of it, he departed thence by a ship into a desert place apart. And that's where he is when this happened. Mm -hmm. So there was a great man of God that left the arena. Mm -hmm. It's like a vacuum. If it wasn't for Jesus, it would have been an irrecoverable vacuum. Mm -hmm. John the Baptist. Now, how would this leave Jesus thinking? This is the man that baptized Jesus. This is the man that introduced him to the world. This is the man that first defined him mm-hmm. in the flesh. He, for his first clear crystal definition of who he was mm-hmm. came from John the Baptist. He's, uh, he's gone now. Not only that, but uh, the scriptures tell us in Matthew 14, 13, the people followed him on foot out of the city. So here, this I'm showing the context of the background. Of this. <coughs> a lot of people had really inconvenienced themselves to get to Jesus. Mm-hmm. Now, this isn't so common in our day, you understand. This is a time we live in a time in an area when the, when the snows for Sunday is announced on Friday, they call off the services on Saturday. This, this, this is what, mm-hmm. We live in a time when inconvenience, people know nothing at all about inconvenience. Mm-hmm. These people inconvenienced themselves. They ran by foot around the Sea of Galilee, which wasn't a little bitty lake, about 16 miles long and 7 miles wide. This is a big body of water, so it's in the context of inconvenient. People inconvenienced themselves now to come to Jesus. Amen. What does Jesus do to people that inconvenience themselves? He doesn't send them away. Mm-hmm. That's one thing he does not do. He does not send them away. But if there's a person that comes to him that looks for convenience, he does send them away. If someone says, I'd like to follow you, but I'd like to bury my father first. He goes, he let the dead bury the dead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I'd like to follow you, but I'd like to bid them farewell at home first. Well, Jesus said, if you put your hand to the plow and look back, you're not fit for the kingdom. So, Jesus, but but if you inconvenience yourself for Jesus, he will he will not be disappointed. And just before this, he'd had compassion on the sick. It had been a rather lengthy day for him. He healed their sick. We dealt with that last Lord's Day. He'd been teaching them, Mark 6, 34. And in John, he throws a little extra here. The Passover was nigh. There were preparations for the Passover. So this was a rather busy time. It been a long day for the Lord Jesus. What's he going to do? Well, that, that's the background. He didn't, this didn't happen right after, a va right after a vacuum or after he'd been alone for all night, like sometimes he's alone all night. This wasn't the case here. Now the scriptures tell us concerning these circumstances that it was, uh, it was evening. The sun was setting. The day's about over. Matthew says, and when it was evening. He'd been busy all day. Mark 6.35 says the day was now far spent. So it had been a very full, active day. Luke 9.12 uses very picturesque language. He said, uh, the day began to wear away. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> more ways than one, huh? Mm -hmm. Day began to wear away. So it was evening. <clears throat> After a full day of work. And it was, uh, wasn't was like the uh, commodious place. It wasn't a real nice building or tabernacle. It was in the desert. They are in the desert. Matthew 14, 15. The disciples said, This is a desert place. Mark 6, 35 says the same thing. This is a desert place. There's nothing out here. Luke 9, 12 says, And we are here in a desert place. <laughs> This is not the place to have a multitude of hungry people. Mm -hmm. Desert place. Another thought occurred to me as I was pondering this. I wonder if a person is willing to go to Jesus in a desert place. <coughs> How about that? They went to him in a desert place. Mm -hmm. Why? Because that's where he was. Yeah. <coughs> so sometimes when there's dry places, huh? And it looks like in a desert place you begin to you need to begin to look about for Jesus. He's been known to be in desert places. And uh, John adds a little something to it that apparently the people started were starting to come to him at the time. John 6 5 says, When Jesus then lifted up his eyes, he saw a great company come to him. So that's now that's the scene. It's, evening's coming on, sun setting. You're in a desert place, it's hot, <laughs> there's nothing out here, no water or anything out here. Here's this big lot of people coming toward Jesus. That's the, that's the background. So what's going to happen to this kind of a setting? Well, I'm going to try and follow this in a sequence of events. Each gospel kind of highlights a little something different. <clears throat> John gives us what like was immediately happened. Jesus sees this multitude coming to them. And he looks at Philip. He lifts up his eyes, saw a great company come to him. He says to Philip, When shall we buy bread that these may eat? <laughs> Test time. What are we going to do about it? He's going to eat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the next verse says, For he knew himself what he would do. He's going to involve the disciples. So here you are. Now here's this opportunity. This is a work of God now that God's ordained. Jesus sees it. Yeah. This is one of God's works. Mm -hmm. So he says, I think I will give Philip first shot at this. Mm -hmm. What about it, Philip? What do you think about this? All these people. Where do you, where do you suppose we could get some bread? Buy some bread for all these people. Well, kind of piecing it together about this time, the other disciples, they chime in. Matthew 14, 15, they came to Jesus and said, Send the multitudes away, that they may go into the villages and buy themselves victuals. They said, go in there to get some lunch, some supper. That's how, that's how we think about it. Mm -hmm. I'll show you how that a lot of people can be very wrong. You see opportunities, different people see opportunities, different ways. Yeah. Jesus saw this multitude coming to him. He saw something to be done. The disciples said, send them away. Mark 6.36 says, send them away 
that they may go into the country round about and into the villages and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. We kind of checked it out already. They didn't bring their lunches. Luke 9, 12 says, Send the multitude away, that they may go into towns of the country round about and lodge. Do a little something else in there. And lodge and get victuals. So that's the sequence thus far. Jesus sees the multitude. Ask Philip where we're going to buy the bread to feed all these people. The disciples said, send them away. And Philip jumps into the situation again. Philip answered him, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them that everyone may eat but a little. <laughs> we kind of take an inventory here. We've, we've done our homeworks, 200 penny worth. I was interested, like, how much is 200 penny worth? And the experts say that that's about eight months wages. Right, so let's just say, let's just take a real low salary and say you made $12,000 a year, that'd be $8,000. Mm -hmm. So we, uh, we've, we figured it all out. Here's our logic. We're going to apply some logic here now, Jesus. It's just good common sense. Mm -hmm. 200 penny worth can't buy enough bread for all this most who just have a little bit. Well, that's the, that's the input so far. Send them away. Haven't got enough money. What do you think about this, Jesus? Jesus says, they do not need to depart. Amen. You give them to eat. Mm -hmm. That's what Matthew 14, 16 says. You give them to eat. <laughs> well, then let's return back to this dialogue between Philip and the disciples and him. And Matthew, Mark 6, 38 Jesus asked them, he says, uh, how many loaves have you? Go and see. So maybe we don't have to go into town at all. Let's we'll find out later. You know, this is 5,000 men beside women and children, so this could have been as high as 20,000 people, almost half the size of Joplin. Let's yeah, check out, see how, much, see how much bread we got available to us. How many loaves do you have? Well, they went, they went out and <laughs> checked. And here's what they reported. They said, we have, uh, but, we have but five loaves and two fishes. It's <laughs> not very much, to say the least. Mark 6, 38 says, and when they knew, so they went out and checked this out. And when they knew, they said five and two fishes. <laughs> Luke 9, 13 says, they said, we have no more but five loaves and two fishes, except we go and buy meat for all these people. John 6, 8, and 9 tells us that Andrew actually answered the question. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, There's a lad here. Oh, now we find we've narrowed it down. There's actually only one person here that thought enough to bring anything with him. There's a lad here which has five barley loaves and two small fishes. Oh, Andrew, you've almost seen it. You've almost seen it. But, what are they among so many? He almost, Jesus has given them a chance. Yeah. Almost saw it. Mm -hmm. He said, give them to eat. That's right. So they, uh, I don't know how long it took to do this, but they must have been very, very swift about doing it. You might say this is one of the first Bible surveys mm -hmm. that was taken. And Jesus, uh, <laughs> well, but he said, bring them to me like no further need to talk about this bring them to me Matthew says he commanded the multitude sit down on the grass we'll proceed with the feeding in just a moment Mark 6 39 says he commanded them the disciples to make them sit down by companies upon the green upon the green grass let's sit on the out in the dirt sit on the green grass in companies and they sat down in ranks by hundreds and fifties Quite a, quite a picture, isn't it? Luke says, Luke 9, 14, he said to his disciples, make them sit down by fifties in company. hundred here split up, so you could kind of move in and out among them. And they did so and made them all sit down. John said, John 6, 10, Jesus said 
Make the people sit down. And there was much grass in the place. So it was commodious. Now, so this, uh, it didn't look, it didn't look like this was possible when it started out. They used human logic, 200 penny worth of bread, kind of divided. We can't get enough bread. That's good human logic. They used a good human reasoning, got five loaves and two fishes, but, well, let's take some statistics here, let's call statistics in, this is not, uh, this is not enough, it's not enough, we, we took a little survey here, so they employed all this human wisdom that people use today, they implied all this human wisdom, took a survey, it's not enough, took concerned mathematics, and we just divided up, it's, it's, Five loaves and two fishes, it's just not enough to go around. Jesus says, bring him to me and tell the people to sit down. And he made them sit down. And then he, uh, he took these loaves, and here the miracle begins. He took the loaves and the two fishes, and looking up to heaven, he blessed them, and break them, and gave the loaves to his disciples and the disciples of the boulders. There's a lot of stuff happening there, just at one sentence. Five to God is a good working number. You can do a lot, God can do a lot with five loaves and two fishes. Uh -huh. If you can get it into Jesus' hand, a lot can be done with it. Amen. The person may feel as though they don't really have much to offer. Uh -huh. You may, as far as a mentally is concerned, you may, you may be in the five loaves and two fishes category, or maybe like a lad. Uh -huh. See, this is this is no handicap with God. Amen. At all. And when God, uh, when something comes to your attention, you see some potential thing that could be done for God. Don't be swift to say it can't be done. Yeah. Don't be swift to say we don't have enough. Don't be swift to say that. Don't be swift to say, well, there's a, there's a, what is this among so many? See, don't be swift to say that. Be as swift to go, to go to Jesus. Mark says, When he had taken the five loaves and two fishes, he looked up to heaven and blessed and break the loaves, gave them to the disciples to set before them. Mm -hmm. And the two fishes he divided among them all. So he, didn't, he didn't ask them, How many fish do you have? Uh -huh. That was like a bonus. He just asked, How many loaves do you have? That was his question. How many loaves? Well, they come back and say, we got five loaves, and we got, we got two fish, too. Mm -hmm. Small fishes, mm -hmm. little mackerels, you know, little, little fishes. But he divided them, too. Mm -hmm. and, but notice, he didn't give it to the multitude. He gave it to the disciples to give it to the multitude. This is how Jesus works now. Luke says, Luke 9, 16, he took the five loaves and two fishes, and looking up to heaven, he break them, and he blessed them, and break, and gave to the disciples to set before the multitude. Now you know the reason for the groups. See? They had to do it discreetly. John says, Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he dis distributed, he distributed to the disciples, and the disciples to them that were set down, and likewise the fishes, as much as they would. Hey, so bread's one thing, but they have some meat along with it. Mm -hmm. Proportionally, the, there was only two fishes and five loaves. You only had 40% as much fish as you did bread, but he said you could have, eat as much fish as you want, even though there's only two. Everyone just eat as much as you want. Mm -hmm. Wonderful mm -hmm. to see these things. And they did. Indeed, they did eat. Matthew 4, 14, 20 says they did all eat mm -hmm. and were filled. So no one had to diet that day. Mark 6, 42, they did all eat and were filled. See, I'm showing you the Holy Spirit makes a point of this. Luke 9, 17, they did eat and were all filled. John 6, 12 says, and they were filled. I've pondered what these people must have thought. <clears throat> Or if they knew that there was only five loaves uh -huh. and two fishes. I wondered about that. I wonder if they knew there was only five and two. I picture this multitude of people that weren't, weren't like a handful of people clustered around Jesus. Perhaps the disciples told them about it when they went out there. Then you face the question, I wonder how many believed it, you know, when they heard it. Here's a basket of bread and fish. There's a lad donated his lunch to us, and this is part of what the Lord made from it. 
They distributed it. Then all four writers tell you how many men were there. Matthew says they, they that were eat they that had eaten were about five thousand men beside women and children. I don't know what percentages were in those days, but that'd be a big crowd by today in today because the men are normally in the minority in those churches. Mark six forty four says there were about five thousand men. Luke nine fourteen says there were about five thousand men. John six ten says the men sat down in number about five thousand. I wonder what would happen if all the church attendance boards only counted men. Have you ever thought about that? Well, the attendance wouldn't look near as big, would it? Couldn't count women, couldn't count children. Just count, just count the women, just count the men. Well, among other things, you learn that numbers aren't all that important to Jesus. Amen. Well, they'd have really spilled up. They'd say, about. Those that believe the day of Pentecost are about. 3,000. It's kind of rounded off at 3,000. Here they rounded off the men at 5,000. I don't. I never have really spent time to calculate about how much that called for the bread to be multiplied. But it seems to me like it was tremendous. It was almost like making something from nothing. Almost like the way he works with us. Amen. Well, after they'd fed the multitudes, they were all filled Jesus said to the disciples, when they were filled, wait until they were filled, when they were filled, he said to the disciples, gather up the fragments that remain, that, that nothing be lost. Mm -hmm. I wonder what Jesus would say if he looked in garbage cans today. I've kind of pondered that. I don't know if you've ever wondered about things like that. But that uh, there'd be nothing lost or no waste. That's kind of the nature of Jesus. Well, they did. They went around and picked everything up, and you got to remember now, this is uh, the lowest possible number would be 5,000, and it could have went up to 20,000. you got to picture yourself not going around picking up the fragments from all these. And when you think about that, 12 baskets, this doesn't look like very much when you look at There wasn't a lot of waste. Right. Twelve baskets. The writer said they were full. Mm -hmm. Well, there's just a little bit in them. Twelve baskets full. I don't know what they did with the baskets. Some of them postulated maybe the uh, apostles got a basket each. Mm -hmm. I wondered if maybe he didn't give the twelve baskets to the boy that gave his lunch. So that would make a little more sense to me that he, he gave the boy the twelve baskets. And there was a result after the people. What do the people say when they see this? Here's what the scripture says, John 6, 14. Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. Well, who's that prophet that should come into the world? Moses said, God is going to raise up a prophet. Mm -hmm. One thing you have to say about these Jews, they did know what was in the Bible. You have to say this about the scribes. They had one up on the preachers of the day. They did tell people what was in the they, what was in the Bible. They did tell people that. Mm -hmm. These people could make a connection right. between what the Bible said about a Messiah <laughs> and him. It's a kind of a connection been lost today. So there's the uh, there's the account of this great miracle of the feeding of the five thousand at the end of a long, heavy day of activity. When the multitude had ran on foot, forgot all about getting the lunch or change of clothes and where they're going to stay, and they were so pursuing Jesus, they didn't, they weren't thinking about that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. The disciples thought about it; they didn't think about it. Mm -hmm. And how that Jesus, he is the first opportunity he gives to his disciples. First, he asked a question. Let's think, where are we going to get enough bread for these people to eat? Where are we going to get it? And then the well, you remember the uh, the accounts. Philip says, "Well, we had 200 penny worth. That's not enough." And uh, Andrew, he just uh, just about saw it. Boy, he come close. He says, "A lad here, the five loaves and two fishes. But what's that among so many?" Well, what can we learn from uh, from something like this? Well, there are several things. One thing is that no one's disadvantaged when they pursue Jesus. Amen. The world may think people are not very smart or that they've wasted their time 
or they can spend time doing other things. But nobody wastes their time that goes after Jesus. And no one will be the worse because they followed Jesus and pursued Him. Amen. Mm -hmm. The world will think that, you, that they are. I've known people that had unusual abilities. And when they gave them to Christ, people said, well, that's kind of a waste of your ability. You could have been, you know, thus and so. But uh, you're not at a disadvantage to pursue Jesus. And if you pursue Him, He'll take care of you. Believe me. Now, we can't offer any guarantees to anybody else. I think we've got to be upfront about this. And if a person's not willing to inconvenience themselves for Jesus, we really can't offer you that you're going to get a lot of stuff from Him. Uh -huh. That's just the way it is. But if you do, it's duly noted by the Lord of glory. He will say something like, they don't need to depart. That's another way to say, don't send them away. And if you do stay with Jesus, he'll put you to work. Yeah. Amen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he'll do that. He'll say, Here's the, I'll, I'll, I'll provide the food, you distribute it. He's still doing this. Yes. He's still doing this. He, he gives the food and says, you distribute it. See, we all don't get private audiences with the Lord. I suppose those audiences are available, but uh, most of the time it's to people who are going to communicate to someone else. Uh -huh, uh -huh. We are distributors for Jesus. Praise God. And Jesus does perceive the situation of people that follow him. Now, the people didn't say, we're hungry. See, if they were the Israelites that would tell Moses, Where you brought us out in this wilderness, we're going to die. We have no bread, no meat. Where is it at? These people didn't say that. <coughs> Jesus took note of their circumstances. And Jesus will test your perception. Mm -hmm. Who are we going to... How are we going to feed these people? How are we going to satisfy their soul? How are we going to do this? How can we supply their need? How's what I have, how is what God has for them going to get to them? How's this going to happen? It's going to happen to the people that walk with them. I'm sure you see that. Amen. And there are circumstances in which we appear destitute. If you just want to use your human reason, you just want to use logic, you just want to use good sense, good common sense, and that's all you want to use, there'll be some circumstances you will simply conclude... There is nothing that can be done. Yeah. Amen. Send them away. <laughs> See if if people when they for instance the people when they go to church, as they say, if they knew if they knew what God has determined is to be given to his people, mm -hmm. a lot of leaders would be saying, Send them away. Uh-huh. We don't have anything. Mm -hmm. See, this is not the case with Jesus. Destitute circumstances, he takes over. And when Jesus knows what he will do, he wants us to participate in it. Yeah. What are we going to do, Philip? And then all 12 of them got to participate. <laughs> Wonderful truth to say. And we must know that we've got to know what we've got to work with. What do we have to work with? He says, go and see. How many loaves do we have? Go and see. Don't you sense that sometimes he says that? Mm -hmm. He may say that to a church. He may say, what do, you, what do you want to go and see? What is available here? What do I have to work with? How many tender hearts do I have to work with? Mm -hmm. What kind of understanding do I have to work with? Who has a, some knowledge of God I can work with? Huh? Who has a pure heart I can work with? What do we got to work with here? And sometimes you may come back and say, well, there's only a couple of people here that looks like are sincere. He'll say, make the people sit down. We'll work with that. Mm -hmm. I know in my soul there's a lot of times I'd have never been fed if Jesus didn't operate like that. Yeah. Uh -huh. He'll find somebody. Somebody's among us who brought something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Somebody's here. Maybe a lamb, but they're here. Yeah. Amen. Mm -hmm. Jesus will use it. It's possible also to see some potential, but then have human reasoning wash it away. Mm -hmm. There is a land here. We found someone. We f but what is that among so many? See? That's where the flesh outreason the spirit there, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And real possibilities aren't judged by what we have. You take a sack lunch, this does not look like anything uh -huh. when you're going to feed thousands of people. 
But you can't judge potential by what you have. Amen. Because Jesus has to work with what you've got. Amen. To make it adequate. And he does not build a warehouse for you to store it. He breaks it as it's needed. Now this is a great kingdom secret to see this. You see it when Israel gathered the manna up. They gathered each man according to his eating. What he needed. You couldn't build a barn and gather a lot of manna into it and use it as you needed it. I get the picture that Jesus broke this bread. It was kind of a, it wasn't an all at once situation. Mm -hmm. He'd give it, they'd distribute it, he'd give it, they'd distribute it, until everyone was fed. And divine distribution is in an orderly environment. He says, make the people sit out in companies, yeah. in groups of 50, mm -hmm. and then in, sub, in bigger groups of hundreds. Mm -hmm. Make them sit down that way. It's an orderly environment. Yes, see? It makes for, the eat, for distribution in a better, better manner. Mm -hmm. And as we mentioned before, numbers aren't as important as some people imagine. Did you see also that God's not honored by waste? Mm -hmm. It's possible to have a whole lot come in your ear and a whole lot go out the other ear. Mm -hmm. That's waste. It's a waste. What you don't you want to practice keeping everything God gives you. Amen. And what Jesus does confirms who he is. Mm -hmm. These people said this. How did they connect breaking the bread with a prophet? Did you notice this? Mm -hmm. <laughs> he didn't say, well, this, this man must be like Moses. Moses gave us bread. He gave us bread. But yeah. instead they made a connection. He was, a, he was the prophet. Mm -hmm. In other words, from what he's done, we should pay attention to what he says. Mm -hmm. Now, it did end up that these people weren't too good at, at listening. Mm -hmm. But what a remarkable miracle this is. I believe all four writers gave it to us for a reason. There's a lot of kingdom secrets in it. Mm -hmm. You can travel with Jesus and miss the point. Yeah. This is possible. You can be right in Jesus' presence, see the very same thing he sees, and come up to a completely erroneous conclusion. Yeah. But if you stay with Jesus mm -hmm. and you listen to Jesus, you will abandon that, that view. Yeah. And you'll be available to feed the flock of God. Well, I thank God for that. For that account.